Hey everyone, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today I'm joined by Dr. Perry Hendricks to discuss the problem of evil, skeptical theism, and really just to give you guys a user's guide to skeptical theism. What is it? How does it address problems of evil? And what are some objections to skeptical theism that you should be aware of? And how do skeptical theists respond to those objections? Like I said, I'm joined by Dr. Perry Hendricks. He recently received his PhD from Purdue University, boiler up, of course, uh, studying under absolute legends like Paul Draper and Michael Bergman and others, and he did his PhD on, of course, the problem of evil and skeptical theism. Perry, thanks for coming on. And uh, yeah, do you have any opening comments or puns that you want to share with the audience? Shoot. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think I have any uh, opening comments or uh or puns unfortunately well that constitutes your opening comments so it's false to say that you don't have any opening comments okay anyway we need to stop i need to stop we're going on so here's the structure of today's video for the audience first we're going to talk about some prominent versions of the problem of evil then we're going to be talking about some prominent versions of skeptical theism after which we'll be talking about perry's favorite version of skeptical theism and how it addresses those versions of the problem of evil Finally, we'll go through various objections to skeptical theism that are popular both in the internet sphere as well as in the academic literature. Okay, and then we shall conclude, of course. So, versions of the problem of evil. Let's just go through three. Uh, Rose's evidential argument from evil, a kind of common sense problem of evil or common sense argument from evil, and then finally a kind of Draperian or Humean argument from evil. So I will turn it over to you. Take us through these arguments. Take as long as you want. Um, but yeah, to, maybe you should just start. What is the problem of evil? <laughs> Uh, I mean, more most generally, the problem of evil is the problem of why there are bad things or disvaluable things in the world. You know, you might wonder, like, why, if there's a perfect being, are these things that are imperfect or bad or uh, or why is there suffering? Things like that is a general way to think about the problem of evil. But OK, so the no seem arguments from evil are probably the most popular, uh, I think. And they are, you know, made most famous by William Rowe. He uses these cases that are pretty bad, right? Some deer in the forest falling under a tree and burning for a few days before dying. And, um, well, actually, I have a really good example to use. I was actually, uh, to illustrate this better than Roe, I think. So I was actually traveling back to Purdue uh, a couple weeks ago, and maybe you heard about this show, but there was this woman who was in the woods um, over by the Horticulture Park. And there's a well in the woods that she didn't know about, and she actually fell down the well. And when the firefighters took her out, there were like, she had a bunch of broken bones and stuff, and she was devastated. She was down in the well for like hours. And the firefighters were trying to figure out, you know, like, why did the woman fall in the well? Turns out she just couldn't see that well. That's why so, I was smiling when when you articulated the story. People people who are in there in the audience are thinking like <laughs> Joe is just this evil person who's like laughing as he's putting telling the story because I knew where it was going. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't want to spoil it for the audience. So anyway, back to we so, got these instances of evil which seem particularly horrifying. Yeah, so how does so how does Ro wield them? Of evil, and what can we uh, infer from them? Well, Ro thinks that we look around and we can't really see any reason that would justify God in allowing this evil, right? We don't see any reason or we don't know or recognize, we don't recognize any reason for why the fawn would suffer for so long. Uh, and so he says, you know, we can infer from this that probably there is no such reason. But you know, if God exists, then there has to be a reason. We might say that, uh, you know, God's existence is uh, incompatible with there being evil for which there is no reason uh, for him to allow, right? But if that's the case, then we can infer from this that since there's probably no reason that would justify God in allowing the suffering of the fawn or the woman in the well, that God therefore probably does not exist. That's how no seem arguments typically go, something like that at least. Yeah, and for the for the audience, when you say no seem, it's basically oh. a reference to our being unable to see the reasons for which God allows certain evils, and then inferring from that either that there are no such reasons or that probably there are no such reasons. So it's called a no see of inference. We go from the fact that we don't see them, no see them, to the conclusion that they aren't there or that they probably aren't there. And if I recall, no see are little bugs in the Midwest, right? Okay. Yes, yes, they are. And you... by Stephen Weichter is the one who coined this inference. <laughs> yes. His name. Okay, 
so that's yeah the no cm argument is there anything else you want me to say about no cm arguments no i mean I, I think that's good um i think that suffice i mean for the audience maybe we could just lay it bare i mean premise one is like there are certain instances of pretty terrible evil for which we see no god justifying reason we don't see any reason we're not aware of any such reason for which that justifies god in allowing them so that's like the first premise then we infer from that that therefore there are no such reasons that justify god in permitting them or perhaps probably there are no such reasons that justify god in allowing them but if theism is true then there has to be some sort of god justifying reason and since there probably isn't such a god justifying reason then it follows that theism is probably false so that that's the uh, that's the overarching argument for the audience um but now let's get on to what what is this common sense problem of evil right so there are different kinds of common sense problem of problems of evil. But let me start out with laying the ground of what they're going to use. They're going to rely on this kind of on this position called phenomenal conservatism. So phenomenal conservatives say, you know, if it seems to somebody that something is the case, like so if it seems to me that uh, I'm talking to Joe right now, that gives me uh, at least some reason for uh, at least some justification for thinking that I am talking to Joe right now, provided that I don't have any defeaters for the seeming. Right. So you can have defeaters like it seems to me that when I put a stick in the water that it's bent, but we know that that's uh, an unreliable seeming. Um, and so in that case, I wouldn't have any justification for thinking that the stick is bent because it's defeated. Right. So the reason that uh, uh, the common sense problems of evil use this kind of justification is that it's immediate. It doesn't require any kind of no seem inference like the one used in no seem arguments from evil. You just have the seeming, it gives you the justification for the relevant uh, beliefs, provided there aren't defeaters. And it gives you some. It doesn't necessarily fully justify, but it does give you at least some. Right. So with that in mind, there are different versions of uh, common sense problems of evil. Uh, the one that I'm going to give is a deontological version, um, because, well, it's just a lot better than the axiological versions. Yeah, so explain just briefly for our audience. Explain what like deontological means, and also explain what axiological means, and how the two kind of interact. So axio axiology has to do with value and deontology has to do with like reasons and stuff like that. So axiology, uh, so I'm going to focus on deontology, but uh, for reasons, and I'll explain why that's preferable when I talk about skeptical theism later, but uh, for reasons unbeknownst to me, philosophers are, way, are focused mostly on axiology, which is a huge mistake. But okay, so deontology has to do with reasons, and the way I'm going to define a deontologically gratuitous evil, so uh, as an evil for which there is no reason that would justify God in allowing it. A little more about that. So whether an evil ju is justified for God to allow is going to depend on the weight of reasons that of the weight of God's reasons for allowing the evil. This is going to be really rough. There's a lot more to say about reasons. There's a lot of literature on the nature of reasons, but there are kind of two basic uh, kinds of reasons. There are justifying reasons and there are requiring reasons. A justifying reason for an action pushes it towards being permissible. A, a requiring reason against an action pushes that action towards being impermissible, right? Yeah, and a so, requiring reason for an action would basically push it towards being obligatory. Um, and when you say push it, do you mean it makes it obligatory or it just counts in favor it of its obligatory? counts in favor. Okay. Because in order to know whether it's obligatory, you need to weigh the requiring reasons against the justifying reasons. And here, um, yeah, I'm, I'm oversimplifying uh, because I think Chris Tucker has some really nice stuff on this that actually has four weights you need to take account of, but I'm sort of going with a standard picture, which I'm, which I, uh, is a little simpler. So yeah, if we want to know whether an action is permissible, we tally up its uh, justifying reasons uh, and their weights, and then we tally up the requiring reasons against it and their weights against it, and we see whichever comes out on top. If the justifying weights are weightier, then it's going to be justified or equal. It'll be justified if the requiring reasons against it are weightier, then it's going to be impermissible, right? So whether an action is impermissible is a function of the weights of the justifying reasons and the requiring reasons. Okay, so then with that in mind, an evil is going to be deontologically gratuitous, just in case God's requiring reasons outweigh his, his uh, justifying reasons. And I'm focusing on God's reasons here because... We uh, need to distinguish our reasons versus God reasons, God's reasons, because there are things called agent-centered reasons and agent-neutral reasons. Agent-neutral reasons apply to all people or all things uh, in any situ in any situation, um, whereas agent-centered reasons will apply to sp specific agents but not to others. For example, you know, I have a reason, uh, a requiring reason to feed my children, 
but Joe does not have a requiring reason to feed my children. Uh, and that's in virtue of the relation I occupy to them and the, uh, the relation that Joe occupies to them. So the reason that we need to focus on God's reasons are because he occupies, if he exists, he's going to occupy a different relation uh, to creation than us. So one example that Anderson gives, if God creates uh, the world, he's going to have sort of a really, albeit weak reason for uh, a really weak reason for uh, letting his creation develop autonomously without his interference. That's going to be some reason for him to not interfere with creation. But you and I don't have that reason because you and I are part of creation. So that won't apply to us, right? Uh, so point being, God's reasons, if he exists, are going to be different than our reasons. So when we're talking about whether an evil is deontologically gratuitous, we're focusing on God's reasons specifically. I think maybe an even simpler way is just like to say that it's impermissible for God to allow it. Um, now, of course, it's impermissible because the requiring reasons against it outweigh the justifying reasons for it. Um, but I guess just a simple way for people to think about it is that an evil is deontologically gratuitous in the relevant sense for present purposes, um, just in case it's impermissible for God to allow it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that in mind that the first premise is just of common sense problems of evil are at least the one that we're looking at here is going to say, you know, necessarily God's existence is incompatible with deontologically gratuitous evil. That seems pretty obviously true, by the way. Uh, <laughs> whereas if we're talking about axiologically gratuitous evil, which is the standard, uh, that just seems to me obviously false. because that's Which about... we haven't defined yet. So tell us what an axiologically oh, gratuitous man. evil is. So an axiologically gratuitous evil is an instance of evil that is kind of a net negative. So to determine whether it's a net negative, you have to see whether it was required for the production of a greater, uh, greater singular good or set of goods that outweighs it or is equally good or whatever, so equals or outweighs it, or whether it is uh, uh, required for the prevention of an evil that's, or set of evils that's equally bad or worse, right? So we need to look at those if we're trying to determine whether an evil is axiologically gratuitous. And that's for, uh, I was gonna say for better or for worse, but I mean, for much, much worse, that's the kind of evil that philosophers typically focus on. Um, and there's lots of, I won't get into the literature on that. I, I'll, I'll stop myself. Back to the deontological version, I guess. Um, unless there's anything more you want me to say about axiology here. I mean, some people might not be seeing why these are distinct. I mean, they, they might say like, well, hold on a second. Like if it's axiolo if an evil is axiologically gratuitous, such that it's not required for bringing about a greater good or an equally good thing, uh, and it's also not required for preventing some equally bad or worse evil, well, then surely God's God's going to have more reason to prevent it than he's going to have to permit it. And so then surely God is not going to be permitted in allowing it to obtain or something like that. So um, now it's good to talk about how there may be reasons which don't pertain to the kind of axiological weights of the outcomes. Yeah. So one way to sort of think about this um is like, think about this. Suppose that I promised you that I was going to like go to lunch with you. This is a really standard uh, <laughs> example I'm using. But suppose that I promised that I was going to go to lunch with you and that'd be pretty awesome, right? So that's like, would produce a million units of good or something like that. Um, and suppose that at the same time, my friend comes up to me and says like, hey, we should go play ping pong or something like that. And ping pong is pretty awesome too. In fact, um, suppose it'll be, a, uh, and the good of ping pong is sort of, it just keeps getting better the longer the game goes on, right? And it's going to be a really long game that we're going to play. So the good is just really immense. In fact, it's 1 million and 1 units of good is what would be produced by this uh, ping pong game. Well, if that's the case, it still looks like I ought to have lunch with you because I promised you that I'd do it, even though it would produce more good to, uh, to uh, go play ping pong, right? But if that's the case, then, you know, um, it's it's permissible to sort of allow this uh, this uh, uh, to do what doesn't produce the greater good. Right. Yeah. So basically, um, reasons for action can come apart from these considerations of um, the axiological weights of outcomes, basically. Yeah. So uh, reasons don't necessarily track value. The more you might have stronger reason to do the less valuable action, to do the action that produces less value. Yeah. And that's why 
we can kind of tease apart the deontologically gratuitous version of the common sense problem of evil from the axiological version. So, so yeah, anyway, um, you wanted to focus on the, the deontological version. And I think you kind of already articulated, well, you may have already well, articulated you know, the, first I got premise. the first premise down, right? Yeah, the first premise. So just reiterate the first premise and so then- the first premise through. is like, you know, necessarily God's existence is incompatible with deontologically gratuitous evil, right? The second one is, you know, there is deontologically gratuitous evil. And the conclusion is, you know, therefore God doesn't exist. Now, the way that common sense problem of evil advocates are going to are going to um, proceed is they're going to say, well, OK, look, for some people, it seems like there is deontologically gratuitous evil to certain people. It does. It seems true that there's deontologically gratuitous evil. And if that's the case, they have this immediate justification for thinking it. And given that the first premise is pretty obviously true, looks like they have provided there are no defeaters, some justification for thinking that God doesn't exist. And that's, yeah, that's how the common sense problem is going to run. Sweet. And then the third version of the problem of evil that we wanted to focus on was a kind of Draperian or Humean version. So um, can you just take us through this? Uh, and my audience, if if you guys don't know about Bayes' theorem, check out my video, User's Guide to Bayes' Theorem. We'll have it pop up in one of these corners up here. So um, talks about evidence and evidential confirmation and the positive relevance account and all the stuff that's going to be relevant to uh, our current discussion. But um, but yeah, uh, you, can, you can assume that they have the basic background of like, well, hey, some piece of evidence or some piece of data is evidence for a hypothesis, just in case it's more expected on that hypothesis than it is under the negation of that hypothesis. So you can you, we can take that as background. So anyway, turn it over to you. So human versions, you know, they identify... Uh, as made most famous by Paul Draper, but you identify some rival hypothesis to theism. So we have theism, which is the view, uh, we can just say that, you know, there's an omnipotent and omniscient being who's perfectly good um, and is responsible for the creation of um, the world and us and so on. And then, so a uh, proponent of Humean arguments for evil is going to say identify a hypothesis that's incompatible with theism, First, so we're going to say the hypothesis of indifference is the one that Paul likes to use. So, which is to say that neither the nature nor the condition of sentient beings on earth is the result of benevolent or malevolent, uh, I can't speak, malevolent, malevolent actions performed by non human persons. So, that's the hypothesis of indifference. It's obviously incompatible with theism, right? And then we can take some fact that we know about in the world, like in this case, the distribution of pain and pleasure. And the way that it, uh, you know, is uh, the way that it functions in biological organisms. And we can say, is that more likely given theism or the hypothesis of indifference? And the proponent of human arguments from evil is going to say, well, look, it's way more likely given the hypothesis of indifference than it is given theism. God has all sorts of reasons to use pain and pleasure uh, to make sure that they work in morally relevant ways. Um, and so it just looks like it's going to be a lot more likely. And, but whereas the hypothesis of indifference, it's just going to be, you know, maybe survival oriented or something like that. Or it's at least not crazy. It's not super low to think that's how it would work. It's not it's not a super low likelihood. Yeah, it doesn't have like as strong a bias as under theism to not allow these sorts of things to obtain, basically. Yeah. And so this fact is just way more likely, uh, claims the proponent of this argument, uh, the, the, this fact about this fact about the distribution of pain and pleasure is so much more likely, uh, is way more likely given the hypothesis of indifference than it is, uh, given theism, but if that's the case, it's going to follow that theism is probably false, very probably false, uh, other things held equal, obviously. Um, and so that's kind of how the human, do you want, do you want me to say more about human arguments? I think that suffices. Okay. So we've got these three versions of the problem of evil on offer and, Drum roll, please. We're going to roll out the skeptical theist response. So uh, no, anyway, there are different versions of skeptical theism. So firstly, just what is skeptical theism? Just just tell us what it is, but then maybe articulate some prominent versions um, before you articulate your favored. Yeah, right. So skeptical theism is in its most general sense. This is slightly unsatisfactory, but in, in, in the most general sense, uh, skeptical theism is a rejection of inferences that go something like, we know of no good that would justify God in allowing some instance of evil to the conclusion that there therefore probably is no such reason. The reason that every skeptical theist is going to reject that is going to differ given uh, the different, uh, the underlying theses that they are endorsing, but every skeptical theist is going to reject that. And that's like as general, I think, as I can make it. Okay, so in that, with that in mind, that's the general way to think about skeptical theism. 
So there are the two most popular versions of skeptical theism on offer, and there are more than these two, obviously, there are actually quite a few, but the most two popular ones are probably uh, Stephen Weichstra's and Mike Bergman's. So Stephen Weichstra uh, has a, he utilizes this epistemic principle called cornea, which says, you know, um, inferences like, I don't see this, uh, I, um, inferences like, I don't see any X to uh, there is no X uh, or uh, is going to be justified only if um, it's reasonable to believe that if there were an X, you know, you'd likely see it. So, for example, I can infer that there's probably no eagle in this room because I don't see one. Uh, because if there were an eagle, it's reasonable for me to think that, you know, I'd probably see it. Um, whereas, uh, but proponents of this version of schedule theism are going to say, well, look, when we're thinking about these, uh, we're, when we're thinking about evil and whether it's permissible, we're, we need to consider God's reasons and what they're like. So is it true that if there were a reason for God to allow this kind of evil, that we would recognize it and that it's reasonable for us to think that we'd recognize it? And they say, well, no. And they usually, uh, will defend this by saying, you know, we are like infants compared to God in terms of intellect. So if there are these reasons, they're probably going to be complex uh, and at that too complex for us to understand. And given that, these inferences at use in arguments for evil aren't going to satisfy cornea. And so they're not going to be justified. Although let me qualify this is that cornea has now is, is about levering, leveraging evidence, which actually um, it, it isn't just about it's not supposed to rule out evil as being any sort of evidence, but it rules it out as being um, a significant kind of evidence that should move you from either agnosticism to atheism or something like that. Yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking is, uh, suppose that the probability that I would be aware of the relevant reasons conditional on there being such reasons is only 0.4. So it doesn't meet, uh, you know, it's not reasonable for me to think that uh, were there to be such reasons, then I would probably be aware of them or I would probably see them. So it's only 0.4. Uh, conditional on there being such reasons, um, but it's like point zero 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 four <laughs> conditional on there being no such reasons or something like that. Or it's actually probably zero on it. But no, anyway. Um, in that sort of case, it's going to be at least quite a lot more expected under the hypothesis that there are no such reasons than it is under the hypothesis that there are such reasons that we wouldn't see it. And so it's going to be pretty powerful evidence for the hypothesis that there are no such reasons, right? Um, so anyway. I'll turn it over to you. Hmm. So the fact not... that we don't see the reason, the, the basic thing is we don't see the relevant reasons, right? And the point is that that is a lot more expected under the hypothesis that there are no such reasons hmm. than it is under the hypothesis that there are reasons. Um, even though it meets, and so it would be evidence under this sort of model. I mean, I'm not defending the claim that it's only 0.4 probable, but under this sort of model, it meets the criteria that, uh, that, Cornea lays down, but it does still seem to be powerful evidence. Hmm. I'd have to think about that more. I'm not, I don't defend cornea. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think this is, I, mean, I honestly think this is John Hawthorne's objection to, to cornea. So, um, yeah, that's interesting. I may I have mischaracterized has it. But... Has Wextra and Perrine responded to that? Oh, no, I, I, not that I'm aware of. I, I'd have to look into it further, the, the details of the literature. I mean, I'm not saying that they haven't responded to it, but. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'll have to think about that more. Okay, so anyway, I know you don't defend cornea, right? So this isn't an objection to you. <laughs> I just wanted the audience to be aware of that. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. so that's cornea. What about Michael Bergman's sort of skeptical theses? Yeah, so his, I think, is the most popular version on offer. It's And um, so he has uh, skeptical theism that the core of it is going to consist of these four different theses. So the first thesis says, you know, we have no good reason for thinking that the possible goods we know of are representative of the possible goods there are. The second thesis is that we have no good reason for thinking that the possible evils we know of are representative of the possible evils there are. The third one is a mouthful, which says we have no good reason for thinking that the entailment relations we know of between the possible goods and the permission of possible evils are representative of the entailment relations there are between possible goods and the permission of possible evils. And then the fourth skeptical thesis is that we have no good reason for thinking that the total moral value or disvalue that we perceive in certain complex states of affairs accurately reflects the total moral value or disvalue that really uh, that they really have. 
And yeah, I mean, those are his four theses. Uh, I guess something to note here is he sort of, he defends them a little bit with some analogies, but um, I think they're sort of taken to be relatively, uh, you know, intuitive or obvious or something like that. And it does seem that most people are on board with this in, in the following sense. Uh, so when you look at objections to Bergman's skeptical theism, nobody or there, there's almost nobody tries to identify such a good re uh, a good reason for thinking that it's possible uh, for thinking that, you know, the possible goods we know of are representative. There are a couple of people who do very few, though. They usually say, like, you know, radical skepticism of some sort ensues if you accept these theses. Um, but that's kind of weird, right? Like, suppose that I said we have no good reason to think that, you know, drunk driving is bad. And, you know, you were to say, well, of course we do. If you were, uh, if you drive drunk, you know, you're gonna not be able to have justified beliefs about morality or something like that. That'd be kind of a weird thing to respond with instead of, you know, identifying good reasons that are direct. Like, you know, if you drive drunk, you'll probably kill somebody or you might, you increase the likelihood that you would kill somebody or yourself. So anyway, uh, that's just to say that uh, what's going on with these theses and what motivates them is that they're supposed to be obvious. And it looks to me like um, uh, that a lot of people sort of, that a lot of people are inclined to endorse them or something like that. Interesting. So I'm going to hold off my objections because this is my least favorite form of skeptical skeptical theism. Um, but anyway, my mind was turning the background wait, on wait. the example. What? Mike Bergman's form is the... the, the yeah, because of Kleiman Hague, I, I think Kleiman Hague's objection is really, really good to it. Um, I think but anyway. you just like got your Purdue uh, card revoked. <laughs> I'm sorry if, if he's watching this. Um, he's he's one of my favorite professors, so he's great. Anyway, um, but anyway, my, my mind was churning on the Bayesian stuff. You know, the little Bayes machine went in, is, in there is going... Brrr. So um, remember the hypotheses that we were talking about was the hypothesis that there are no such reasons and the hypothesis that there are reasons. And the example that I gave was that the probability that we would be aware of the reasons on the hypothesis that there are reasons the model that I gave assigned that a 40% chance. And the probability that we would be aware of such reasons conditional on there being no such reasons was very, very, very low. Let's say that's zero. Because um, if there are no such reasons, we can't be aware of them, of course. But our data, remember, is not that we are aware of reasons. Our data is that there are no such reasons. Rather, our data is that we're not aware of any such reasons. So what we have to compare is the expectability of that or the likelihood of that data conditional on the respective hypotheses. And actually, once we do that, it's going to be 0.6 probable that we wouldn't see the the reasons, we wouldn't be aware of the reasons, conditional on the hypothesis that there are reasons, whereas it's going to be the probability of one or 100% that we wouldn't be aware of any such reasons, conditional on there being no such reasons. So actually, in the model that I gave, the likelihood ratio or the Bayes factor would only be one divided by 0.6, which is not very high. Um, I mean, it's, it's still evidence, right? I mean, it is evidence, um, but... Uh, I mean, what that does show is that if cornea is taken in such a way that meeting the cornea conditions is required for evil being evidence uh, against God's existence, then it's false. Um, but, you know, then we'd have to get into leveraging evidence. And um, I think that's a, a leveraging evidence is evidence that can take you from like agnosticism to theism or from atheism to agnosticism. Well, I mean, just depending on your your priors, I mean, a, a base factor of what is it? Um, six, ten. Uh, OK, so it was one divided by point six. So that's one divided by three fifths. So that's just five thirds. So that's one and two thirds. So it's 1.6 repeated. Um, a 1.7 base factor might be able to take you depending. <laughs> I'll have to, I'd have to sit down and do the Bayesian math. But anyway, I just wanted to clarify, cl clarify that for the audience. I said that it was really, really powerful evidence, but um, I want to correct that and say it's only 1.7 times more likely the data conditional on there being no such reasons than it is conditional on there being such reasons. Okay, sorry for the audience. That was very, very technical. <laughs> I really shouldn't be saying this, but um, I probably just lost a lot of people. I'm sorry, people, but you can zone back in now. So everyone pay attention now. Um, I just had to slightly correct something that I said earlier because my Bayes machine was telling me to do so. Okay, anyway, um, we just went over Bergman's skeptical theism. Uh, now, what about your skeptical theism? You have a favorite version. Oh, right. Okay, so... I, uh, my favorite version is what I'm going to call deontological skeptical theism. It focuses on reasons, and in particular, God's reasons, if he exists, instead of just axiology. So instead of just the value of different uh, states of affairs that we know of, right? Uh, so first, some reason why we should focus on this is because if we're trying to predict what God will do, right, 
we need to know his reasons and reasons are going to encompass more than axiology. So we need, uh, if we want to know uh, whether an evil is permissible, right, we need to take into account more than just uh, the goods that are produced by it. Because given the, like the example we talked about earlier, what's permissible and what you ought to do isn't necessarily determined by uh, goods and by what, what does the most good or whatever, right? So that's just like, it seems to me very clear that that's what we should focus on, both in arguments from evil and also in like skeptical theism. That's what we ought to focus on. Um, I think on I think it was Roe who led everyone astray by just uh, not to point fingers, you know, uh, but uh, he uh, with his focus, the way that he defines gratuitous evil is in terms of whether the evil was necessary for the production of a greater good or set of goods or the uh, or to avoid an, uh, an equally bad or worse evil or set of evils. And that sort of just uh, led everyone to sort of work in that same axiological framework. Well, and hey, now you get your Purdue. Hey, you get your Purdue card revoked right now because Roe was also at Purdue. So, so <laughs> hey, I mean, Purdue is like the the hub of like problem of evil and skeptical theism. It's pretty cool. But anyway, I'll just look. There, there are the Purdues and the Perdones. The Purdues are to reject Roe's version of the argument from evil, and the Perdones are to uh, don't reject uh, Berkman's skeptical theism. We need to stop. Okay. Anyway, is that all you wanted to say on uh, oh, no. your favorite? So person? that's the motivating factor of like why we need to focus on reasons. Here's what I'm going to say about deontological skeptical theism. So this is the way I'm going to, uh, that we can phrase it in sort of a simplified way. I have this published elsewhere and forthcoming in a more technical way, but this is a simpler way to think about it. Hopefully simple. So for the permission of any evil uh, we have no good public antecedent reason to think it's likely that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight of his reasons. So, okay, by public reason, I just mean a reason that isn't one of your own mental states. It's a reason that's in principle equally accessible to everyone. You know, that there's a car out there out my window is a public, uh, in some sense, a public reason. Um, or that a sample is random is a public reason for the it's not biased or something like that. Whereas private reasons are going to be things like seemings or intuitions or beliefs, things that you have a sort of privileged access to, right? And then by an antecedent reason, I just mean a reason that sort of doesn't take into account our beliefs about whether or not God exists, sets those aside. And then uh, finally, uh, by, you know, saying that we don't have or we have no good reason to think it's likely that some that X, I mean, we don't currently recognize a reason as being a good one for thinking X, right? So it's ha it has to be a reason that we recognize. So like, think about it this way. If I'm driving in my car and there is a car ahead of me that puts its left-hand blinker on, that's a good reason for me to think that that car is going to turn left. But if one of my daughters sees that blinking light, it's not a good reason for her to think it's, uh, for one of them to think that it's going to turn left because, you know, it's just a blinking light to them. So the reasons we're, uh, we're, the reasons we're interested in here are ones that we would recognize. Okay, and it's focused on God's reasons for the reasons that we talked about earlier, um, because God is going to have a different set of reasons than us. And then, okay, here's one very, very quick argument for why this is just the default position and obviously true. So, yeah, so before before you give the argument, just restate oh. the thesis, please, that, that you're trying to, the no antecedent public reason yep. thesis. So, right, so deontological skeptical theism it can be stated this way. So for the permission of any evil E, we have no good public antecedent reason to think it's likely that the perceived weight of God's reasons uh, resembles the actual weight of his reasons. Okay, so that's deontological skeptical theism. And here's why it's the default position, and you should think it's true. Um, so given the way that we just talked about um, having a good reason for something, it means that you recognize it as being a good reason for that thing, at least in, this tr in terms of deontological skeptical theism. But that means that it's the default position because it will be true until and unless you're given a reason for thinking that it's likely that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight of his reasons. That is just definitionally true. And so it'll be the default position to take. And then so then the next question is whether there are these good reasons to uh, think that. And um, yeah, so that it's the position that everyone should start at. And also the final position everyone should accept since, you know, the objections don't work. Well, we'll see about that. No. <laughs> uh, so, 
Could you just, I was writing down the thesis um, so that I have it in mind while you were giving your argument. Um, and you just went over it briefly. So just for the sake of me and perhaps for the sake of the audience, could you just go through the argument one more time? The argument is just that it's a definitional truth, right? So when we're thinking about having a good reason, given uh, the way I've defined having a good reason, it's going to be true until and unless we are given a good reason for thinking it's likely that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight of his reasons. Um, it's going to be true until and unless we're given a reason for thinking that, right? So it's kind of like, um, it's going to be true until and unless that I have no good reason to think there's a car out in front of me until someone, you know, gives it, until I recognize this reason for thinking that, right? So it's the default stance. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you think like agnosticism on whether or not there's such a good reason is the default stance? I mean, I feel like you're taking a stance and saying well, no, there so is no such Keep in mind, reason. though, on if there is a good reason, the way that we're talking about good reasons are ha actually recognizing the reasons, right? It's not mm. just that there is a reason. Because remember, um, I was giving you the example of we're driving in a car and there is the good reason. I have a good reason to think that the car is going to be turning left in front of me, but my daughter doesn't. It's just a blinking light to her, right? Mm. So you have to recognize the reason. That's the ones that matter here because we're trying to justify this inference um, and yeah. these other sorts of things. So yeah, it's it's... Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Do you, and uh, do you buy the argument? I think it is clear. Um, now, I'd, I'd probably have to reflect on it further. I, I'm not going to take a stand on it here. I'll just say it actually strikes me as reasonably plausible on first pass. Um, but oftentimes arguments strike me as reasonably plausible on first pass. And then I sit down and I reflect on it further. And I do that when I'm exercising and whatnot. And I'll be like, oh, here's an objection. I wonder if that works. And anyway, um, can so I'll just say. In, uh, can I put that as an endorsement on the back of my book? Reasonably plausible at first pass. <laughs> 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 yes, of course. Oh, that's great. Um, okay. So we've gotten your version of skeptical theism. We've gotten your argument for it. Um, but let's just get all the threads together before we go on to the objections. Um, how exactly does this address each of the three problems of evil that we covered? Like how precisely does it do so? So let me make a general point first, which is that this is going to affect all arguments for atheism that make use of the perceived weight of God's reasons, right? And it seems to me that almost all of them, or like the evidential kinds are going to have to go uh, are going to have to make the use of the perceived weight of God's reason. So I don't think it's limited to arguments for evil. It's going to be very wide ranging. Including okay. arguments for theism too. I'll just say that. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I thought that was going to come up as an objection. I have a whole, chapter, will, but I... I have a whole chapter in my book on this and how it affects theism <laughs> and atheism. And I know. I, develop... I just, yeah. listen, I know some audience viewers are going to be like, oh yes. And they're just going to click away at that point. But I just like, I couldn't resist and I had to say it. I'm sorry. That'd Go be on. That'd be a weird one to click away at, but um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, anyway, uh, I don't want to make you burst out again here, but uh, so, okay. Um, so how it's going to affect the noceum argument from evil is pretty obvious, I take it. So, right, so it makes an inference from, for some evil, um, so the way that we framed the noceum argument from evil was something like, you know, look at this instance of evil, it's really bad, or we recognize no uh, reason that would justify God in allowing this evil, therefore probably there is no such reason, right? So it's depending on this perceived weight of God's reasons as favoring the sort of uh, unjustified evil, right? But if it's true that we have no good reason to think the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight, then, you know, the inference isn't going to go through. Like, why would you accept that inference if you also realize that we have no good reason to think that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles his actual weight? You shouldn't be inferring things from the perceived weight if that's the case, right? So no seam arguments are going to be affected in that way. Um... Anything more you want me to say about no seam arguments? I mean, do you have to think that your sample is sort of representative of what you're trying to generalize over or that it resembles what you're trying to generalize over in order to justifiably make the generalization? You know what so, I'm asking? Let me think of what I want to say here. So it's a lot more complicated to like explain the general principle in play, but I think it's a lot easier when you focus on this particular premise which is about, so think about it this way. This is a premise talking about the perceived weight of God's reasons, right? So this evil is supposed to be, given what we can see, so the perceived weight of God's reasons, it's unjustified. And then you're going to conclude from it that it's therefore probably unjustified. But hold on, didn't we just say that we have no good reason to think that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight? 
So I don't think I, there is a general principle that I work with in, or uh, in my book and stuff, but I think you don't even like, you can just sort of see uh, in this particular instance that it very obviously applies, right? Because you're using the perceived weight of God's reasons. And we already accepted that. We have no good reason to think, you know, that's, I don't want to say reliable, but reliable will work for here. Interesting. I'm wondering now if this could serve as an objection to your principle or like deontological skeptical theism, like, I don't even know if this is true, but like, I'm just thinking if it were true, right? I'm just testing out the idea, but like, maybe, maybe someone out there, philosophers defend all sorts of crazy things, but maybe a philosopher has defended the view that there's a kind of like just defeasible background assumption, presumption rather, that, that we can justifiably take for granted that a sample is representative or res resembles um, some larger population from which is drawn, unless we have good reason for thinking that it's not representative and that it doesn't resemble it. And so then provided that we have that kind of defeasible, justified presumption in the background, there is at least some good public antecedent reason for thinking that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight, because that's like a sample drawn from a population. Um, the sample of the God's reasons of which we are aware or that, that we perceive and the weight of them. Um, so maybe there's this defeasible presumption and maybe if you don't have that presumption, I, I could just think of a, a philosopher trying to argue, like, if you don't have that presumption, then, you know, inductive inferences are just gutted or something like that. <laughs> I can try, I can see someone trying to argue for that. Cause you know, if we always had to have some reason for thinking that our sample was representative, yikes. Um, so yeah, no, I don't just... endorse that view. Uh, that is definitely a false view. Okay. Although um, uh, I have a few comments on that, but it's, uh, let me keep them brief, I guess. One is that, yeah, right, what's doing the work is not just that we don't have a reason, um, this, it would be more complicated to talk about this, but it gets into uh, um, whether that produces a defeater in you uh, for certain reasons. But the other comment is, I think uh, there, there's also some reason to think that in these inferences, like, yeah, it, it's definitely not true that for every inference, you need this positive reason for thinking it's uh, representative. Definitely true. But I mean, think about like, suppose you read a study and that there were no, po and suppose that um, uh, some study that some drug was very effective in this group of cancer patients. In fact, it's so effective it cured, you know, all their cancer. And then at the end of the study, the doc the the doctor's like, so you know, it cured this uh group of patients. So probably it's gonna cure all cancer patients. And then you're like, hey, dude, you know, why do you think it's gonna apply to all cancer patients? And she's like, I don't know. And that yeah, well, of... she says there's a defeasible presumption that that it would. Uh that wouldn't really be satisfying. I guess that's what you're getting at. Well, one was like, if, if this person really can't produce a reason, like that gives you kind of reason to doubt. And once you have that doubt, that's going to function as the defeater here. Um, because, I mean, imagine just talking about someone and they literally couldn't, this this doctor could not give you a reason to think that uh, this inference was like a good one, that her sample resembled uh, or was representative of the whole. Um, wouldn't that strike you as a reason to sort of doubt that inference? Probably. Um... I mean, why just, do you, uh, why do scientists spend so much time trying to show that their samples are unbiased and uh, and are representative? Oh, because that makes it far more epistemically reliable, right? Um, but you know that just that just boosts the epistemic credentials a lot higher. But that doesn't mean that in this case it has zero epistemic boost or what have you. I mean, if somebody can't produce the reason, it seems to me to be a pretty good reason to doubt it. Um, yeah, I mean, see, I guess there are two different sorts of things. We could be asking. Can they produce a reason for thinking that this observed class is representative of the unobserved class from which it's drawn versus so th there's sort of two claims here. One is the claim of resemblance or, or representativeness. The second claim that we could focus on is that the broader class um, has the relevant feature that, that the perceived or observed class has. Now, the scientists can sort of cite as a reason for the broader class for thinking the broader class has it um, because the narrower class has it. And because there's this defeasible justified presumption in favor of thinking that would you have an observed class out of a larger whole and something holds in that, that observed class um, there's a defeasible presumption for thinking that it also holds in the larger whole. So they, they can, she can give a reason for thinking that the broader class has the feature. And, and that's sort of what I'm thinking here. Um, we, among the perceived weight of God's reasons, they don't seem to be God justifying. Uh, and if there's a defeasible background presumption that 
observed, you know, features of observed classes generalized to the populations from which they're drawn, then we also have some reason to think that the broader range of reasons, God's actual weight of reasons, also has that feature, namely being such that it's not God justifying for the relevant evil. I guess that's what I'm, I'm wondering about. I don't know whether or not this succeeds, dude. I'm just throwing this out there. Yeah, yeah. So um, oh, I got a few comments. I should limit myself, though. So one is that I want to focus on, or I don't think resemblance and representativeness necessarily match onto one another. And this isn't like we're digging in a uh, population for a single good that would justify God, right? It's just we're trying to see what the weight turns out as. Um, so... I'm not sure they exactly map onto one another, but the second question, I had a question for you. Do you think that this is going to, so this is going to provide this sort of presumptive justification for any kind of inference like this? Is that the general thought? So I think someone who's who's um, arguing this way would have to be committed to that. I mean, it, it does seem to be liberal, but um, <laughs> philosophers defend lots of liberal views. <laughs> um, so it does seem a little bit hasty, um, but it's an interesting and, thought. I mean, That's why I raised it. So, I mean, suppose it is, you, you can even say it counts in favor, but like, so maybe it's a reason, but it's not a good reason to think it's likely. So it's one reason, but you got to actually, uh, like, we need a good reason to think it's likely that uh. um, the perceived weight of God's reasons presents the actual weight. So maybe that nudges it in the direction, although I'm very dubious about that. Um, okay. Maybe it does, but I don't think you, are you committed, like, you'd have to be committed to the view that it makes it likely. And that's pretty wild. It's worth noting in one really weak sense that it seems to be something that critics, both critics of skeptical theism and skeptical theists can agree on, that if it's true, it does undermine these kinds of inferences, because nobody can test that. They all go for the excessive skepticism objection. Um, but obviously, that's not that doesn't mean that it's right. But um, for whatever popular opinion is worth in philosophy, probably not much. But yeah, so we could go back and forth forever on this, but what we were just covering how... Um how your deontological skeptical theism interacts with Rowe's argument. And so let's do the common sense and then the Humean one, and then we will go into some problems. Alleged problems. Actual problem. <laughs> okay, go on. <laughs> um, so, okay, uh, right. So the common sense one, I'm not sure that deontological skeptical theism itself undermines it, undermines it although I have to, I, I, I'm on the edge of that but something very close to deontological skeptical theism is going to undermine it. Uh, and actually, let me let me preface it with this. My first response to the common sense problem evil in all its forms is an incredulous stare. Uh, when people tell me that some evil seems gratuitous, it's like, come on, man. You don't know what, uh, are you really thinking about what deontological gratuity means or what axiological gratuity means? Like, It's like saying that the number of stars seems to you to be even. Or it's like saying that tearing your ACL is the worst possible pain in the world. Or it's like saying that Mount Baker seems to you to be the the most uh, or the tallest mountain in all of Washington. Um, it isn't. But, you know, if somebody told you that, you'd be like, well, that's that's kind of weird. Uh, you probably just think it's a really tall mountain or you probably think that tearing your ACL is a really bad pain. You know, like that's more plausible when people say that an evil seems gratuitous. What they mean, I think, is that it seems really bad. Because think about what, de yeah. what deontological gratuity amounts to. Are you really saying that it seems to you that when we tally up all of God's reasons, that it weighs more that the um, that the requiring reasons against the action outweigh the justifying reasons for the action? Really, that seems to you to be true. Um, I'm very yeah, skeptical I mean, about that, but it's possible that some people have. It. People yeah, don't like I mean, when I say that. Uh, <laughs> so let me just admit that some people might have the seeming, because you know, lots of people have lots of crazy seemings. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. So I mean, there's a sense in which I, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that that response because oftentimes I hear people say like, "It just seems to me that God exists." I'm like, or like that Christianity is true, and I'm like, seriously. I mean, like it seems like maybe it seems to you that uh, <laughs> maybe it seems to you that there's a creator. I I even doubt that. But like, you have this intellectual seeming. It strikes you just as immediately as the law of non-contradiction does, or or maybe not as immediately, but like that really strikes you that there's this omnipotent and omniscient and morally perfect, independent, I'll say, necessarily existing creating universe. Like, I kind of doubt that, bro. But like, <laughs> I mean, so I can get that reaction. But I I'm wondering, like, can they just say, like, listen, 
the sense in which it seems impermissible for God to allow these certain sorts of evils is just the same ordinary sense in which we have other moral intuitions. Like it just seems impermissible for someone to um, torture a child for fun, but also it seems impermissible for the accomplice to that, to just like sit there and allow it to happen. So, I mean, it just seems impermissible for them to allow that to happen. I, I you know, I don't have to make up this you know crazy calculation and, and have my seemings latch on to like the requiring reasons for this person to, you know, uh, uh, the requiring reasons and how that balances with their justifying reasons. Like, no, it just seems impermissible. You can't do that. Uh, and it, that just seems clear. And, and and similarly, when when people read about like the Holocaust literature or they, they read about very uh, horrendous things that happen to people. Like maybe they really can be struck with this poignant sense that it's just impermissible for God to allow this sort of thing. It just God just can't allow that. And I, I feel like I've had something like that seeming before, but I don't know. Um, I, so I'll just turn it over to you. I'll, I'll let you respond to that. And then I'll, I'll try to restrain myself and not reply. You no, know, I'll just say, I mean, it's possible that there are these seemings. I don't, I don't want to like, I mean, yeah, there, there, there might be some people who have them. I don't need, I don't want to stake my case on that. I just, I'm skeptical that the amount of people who say that they have these actually have these seemings. So I think you said skeptical. there were two responses and this was your sort yes. of first one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even really, I mean, it's one response, I guess, because I just don't think very many people, if any, have these seemings. Uh, so it's just a preamble, I guess, one that nobody likes. But um, although you express some sympathy, so uh... so I, I, there's a sense in which I have sympathy, and there's a sense in which I don't like it. I mean, I I, I do kind of find plausible the response there that I gave, where it's like we don't need to weigh up the requiring reasons. Like our intuitions can just be sensitive to impermissibility facts. And anyway, just, did just we I need to if move that can on. Be reversed okay. on your, I, I wonder if that can be reversed on your complaints about people saying it seems that Christian theism is true. I think so. It might have a similar uh, response. You see, like maybe like a, a seeming that. Uh, well, I guess you already granted that a creator exists, or you didn't grant that. You granted it could seem, uh, per, it could seem plausible. It, it it's might more seem plausible that a creator exists. Yeah, it's more plausible to me yeah. that that could strike one as a kind of, you know, it could strike one as plausible in the sense of a kind of uh, non-intellect or non-inferential intellectual seeming than it is that like God exists specifically or the Christian God. Um, but uh, oh, wait, anyway, let me let me make one more response to your incre uh, to the point about incredulity. So okay. Also, by the way, maybe I uh, this I thought about when I was talking about skeptical theism of naming I because I, I'm interacting with um, you know people who are uh, critics of it. You know, I think a good uh, maybe maybe I, I was thinking about opposing skeptical theism with credulous theism. Don't you think that would have been a good uh, anyway? Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so okay, on on your incredulous stare, um, I want to let me let me push back a little um, in hopes of making sure you don't become unrestrained so you know you say an evil like some instances of evil seem impermissible like you just you know like god wouldn't allow that something like that maybe that's your initial impression but like suppose then you're like okay but what does that mean exactly well it would mean that when we tally up all of god's reasons it has this effect would you still have that seeming when you really like think about and understand uh what it means like once you really like keep that in mind does that seeming persist that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'd probably just have to do some phenomenological introspection to to do that. I mean, like, listen, it, it persists in the case of the torturer. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, maybe the torturer is situated, you know, I, can I rule out that the torturer, the person who's allowing the torture is situated in some unique way in history that, that, that they have some weighing up of the requiring reasons that are, <laughs> do I still have the intuition then that it's permissible? Yes. Uh, no, but anyway, um, we need to move on. So, I mean, I'll just, Okay, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I think that's an interesting, good, that's a good point. And like, I'll reflect on that and I'll think about it. And my audience should as, as well. So. Okay. Yeah. So I also think that if anybody does have these intuitions uh, that, you know, there is a defeater for them. And the thought is just like, okay. Um, just the fact that we're thinking about whether this evil is deontologically gratuitous, like this is very related to my incredulous stare. It's just like, why would we think it like do we have any reason to think that our seemers so to speak are reliably tracking and weighing god's reasons with respect to evil and uh to be clear it's god's reasons that matter here not our reasons so maybe you want to say like we're maybe our seemers i'm not sure this is true this i'm skeptical about this maybe you want to say our seemers can track human reasons well enough but it's another stretch to go to god's reasons um and if we have no reason to think that our seamers are tracking those, um, 
and we come to see that, you know, I think that's going to provide us with the defeater for any scenes there are. And also, let me qualify this once more. So I'm going over two problems with this. Um, I actually, it, uh, I think there are, I forget, I think four problems with each version of the common sense problem of evil. So I'm just going off the ones that are like easiest to talk yeah. about. So these yeah, are the only problems fine. I think. That's fine. And, um, you know, I'm not going to push back on that point. We'll, we'll, the objection is to skeptical theism make use of these sorts of that that sort of point as well. But okay, the Humean one, finally. Uh, how does your deontological skeptical theism address the kind of Draperian argument? So every time you say Draperian, it gets me. So um, so the way that it's going to affect the Humean arguments for evil is kind of similar to our discussion we were having about no seam inferences. So I mean, it's just sort of like when you look at what deontological skeptical theism is saying, it's saying we have no good reason to think that the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight of his reasons for these. Um, but if that's the case, then what, I mean, what are we going off of to predict um, how likely to say that uh, the facts about evil, the pain, the distribution of pain and pleasure are less likely on theism than on the hypothesis of indifference. Presumably we're going off the perceived weight of reason of God's reasons, right? What else would we have to go off of? But if that's the case, that's going to undermine, um, that's going to undermine that uh, uh, premise or rather conclusion. <laughs> Once you see that, uh, I mean, I guess I want to say this. So once you see that uh, deontological acceptable theism is true, you should see that it gives you reason to think, to reject that conclusion. It gives you reason to think that, you know, we can't really ascribe a probability given our public antecedent reasons. Important qualification. Okay, interesting. So with all that out of the way, we've gone through three versions of the problem of evil. We've gone through, in fact, three versions of skeptical theism, the, the kind of cornea, the um, Bergmanian skeptical theses. <laughs> And then your deontological skeptical theism. And we saw how your deontological skeptical theism addresses those three versions of the problem of evil. And now it's time to get into some objections to skeptical theism. So the first objection I want to get onto is Kleiman Hage's. So Nevin Kleiman Hage recently published an article, maybe even more than one, but at least one, at least one article wherein he develops this sort of um, objection to skeptical theism and or at least versions of skeptical theism, rather. It takes into account what you were just saying at the end there. You're like, uh, it seems as though your deontological skeptical theism prevents us from ascribing a, a probability of the the relevant data of, let's say, pain and pleasure conditional on theism. But but once you grant that, it just follows from Bayes' theorem that we also can't assign a probability, but it's just inscrutable what the probability of theism is on the data, right? Because the probability of theism on the data is a function of the probability of the data on theism, right? Of course, together with the prior probability of theism and the probability of that data itself. So if it's inscrutable, or we just have no clue what the prob probability is of the data conditional on theism, then it's likewise inscrutable. Just ma This mathematically follows it. It's likewise inscrutable what the probability of theism is on the data. And so then it seems as though... Um, you, you should join me in the agnostic camp because, uh, you know, what's the probability of theism? Well, in order to de determine that, we have to look at the total range of data. But if the probability of theism on this particular range of data is inscrutable, then uh, we don't know whether it swamps all the other data. We don't know how it relates to all the other data. In short, we have the probability of theism itself becomes inscrutable, really, just the posterior probability conditional on the relevant data that we have. So uh, sorry, Nevin, that was a, if he's watching this, um, that was a uh, informal articulation of his argument. And, you know, he goes into the, the Bayesian machine in all the weeds there. Um, but if you want to, you know, clarify, or if you want to go through it and respond to this point, uh, I will turn it over to you. Nevin is the Bayesian machine. He doesn't go into it. Um, so that's uh, true. So uh the title of his article is an article itself my goodness i've never seen a title that long before so um <laughs> yeah uh right i saw your eyes light up when i made that comment and i knew exactly why they did but right that's why i added that i uh added the qualification at the end because ske deontological skeptical theism is restricted to our public antecedent reasons um and so strictly speaking it's not going to have that result um, because you might have private reasons or something like that um, for ascribing a probability to it. Um, so, yeah, I guess I just don't think it necessarily follows um, from the version of skeptical theism that I articulated because it's a restricted kind. You might have private reasons to ascribe a probability. Interesting. I mean, I'm just trying to think, like, wouldn't 
I mean, you, you seem to be casting doubt on all the potential private reasons that, that could be bearing on this question. Did, like, weren't you just doing that earlier? Like, uh, the well, the intuitions, you know, they're going to be unreliable in this context precisely because um, they're not really going to be tracking the God's actual rate of reasons. So, like, what sort of private reasons could guide us here? Uh, given your deontological skeptical theism, it seems like you're also doing away with those those sorts of private reasons from being able to bear on the uh, being able to help us assess the probability of uh, the data conditional on theism. Yeah, so <laughs> this is the easy answer. The easy answer was just this point I made, which is that it's not going to apply given this, qual this qualification. The other answer is I have a model for sort of predicting God's actions that I lay out in this book I have, um, which is much more complicated. I, uh, I, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 it would take a while to go into that, but I do have a model. So in addition, so my first point is like, it's just not going to apply to this kind of skeptical theism given its restrictions, but you're right that that poses, uh, an issue, uh, what I've said about private reasons. I'm not sure it's definitive, but it does pose a problem, uh, but I do have a model for predicting, uh, God's actions that I've articulated, but, uh, so I would probably use, uh, or I would use that model okay. uh, to sort of respond to this. Yeah. So that book um, is just called Skeptical Theism with Palgrave Macmillan, right? I'm very creative. So yes, that's the title. <laughs> I can't believe the title isn't already taken. Um, but yeah, so it's it's called Skeptical Theism with Palgrave Macmillan. It, is it out yet or is it like for, forthcoming or? October 17th, I think it comes out. Yeah. Okay, everyone, check the link in the description. There is a link to pre-order Perry's book, which you should all immediately pre-order. So... No, 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 they should all immediately cite it. And then after they cite it, they can buy it. And then if they want to, they can read it. But citing is the first thing to do. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay. So that's Nevin Kleimanhaga's objection. Um, Which is, by about... the way, I think is a very good objection. Uh, I think it's much better than most of the objections in the literature. I quite like it, uh, to be honest. That's why my eyes lit up. I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, what about uh, this kind of Draperian counterbalance? Every time I say it, I laugh. What about this Draperian counterbalancing unknown reasons objection? Uh, you know what? I, I articulate the last one. What is this objection and how do you respond to it? Well, way to move that over to me. Um, uh, but um, by the way, if I ever like drop a song with Dr. Dre, I think we're going to have to call our band, you know, Draperian. But anyway, um, so <laughs> this kind of objection which I think is actually the most powerful objection to skeptical theism. It's kind of shocking that there's not much of a discussion of it. You have uh, Mike Bergman talks about it somewhere, and I think in his 2009 paper, but it's um, unfortunately not uh, discussed much. You know, even uh, uh, even like uh, Draper and Swinburne don't even talk about that. They do talk about it, but I feel like they should say more about it. But anyway, so this is all to say it's a very good and clever objection, um, and I think powerful. So. This objection uses like the principle of indifference, or if you don't like that, your favorite equiprobability principle. So <laughs> you, um, uh, uh, so the principle of indifference says roughly something like if you have no reason to favor one hypothesis over another, you're equiprobable, right? So now suppose that we're thinking about whether there is an unknown. So we have the perceived weight of God's reasons for some action. Now we're thinking, is there an unknown reason for or against God permitting this, right? And then there are two options, either yes, there is an unknown reason or no, there isn't. And so if we say, um, well, there are more than two options. Those are the two options, but there's also an additional one. There are no reasons, right? But we can say that we have no reason to think that there is, uh, we have no reason to think it's more likely that there's an unknown reason uh, or that there is an unknown reason against permitting some evil than that there is an unknown reason for permitting the evil, right? So those two will be equiprobable. This third option, that there is no unknown reason at all, um, for or against, is another is a third option, right? But if these two, uh, if the first two reasons are equiprobable, that means that they have to have a maximum probability of each one being slightly, just a sliver less than fifty percent. That's their maximum probability because there's a third option, right? If they were each had a probability of 0.5, then there'd be no room to ascribe a probability to the um, there being no unknown reason, right? But surely that's going to have a non-zero probability. But if all that's the case, then it's going to be more likely than not that there either is no unknown reason for God permitting the evil or that there or, or that there's an unknown reason against God permitting the evil or that there's no reason at all. But if either of those two options happen, 
that means that it's more likely than not that the perceived weight of God's reasons will resemble the actual weight of his reasons. I feel like I didn't explain that well at all. So you have three <laughs> options. One is that there is no unknown reason for or against God permitting evil, that there just aren't any reasons. The reasons we perceive are all there are. And there are two other options. The second option is that there is an unknown reason for God permitting the evil. And the third option is that there's an unknown reason against God permitting the evil. Now, two of these options will have the result that uh, the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight. If there are no uh, no unknown reasons for or against, that means that, you know, the set of reasons that we perceive are the actual reasons uh, and or the weight of the reasons we actually perceive is the actual weight, in which case, you know, the perceived weight does resemble the actual weight and skeptical theism will be false as I've defined it. But if there are unknown reasons against God permitting an evil, that's just going to make an evil so that appears permissible or that um, is uh, its perceived ways for impermissible. It's going to make it even more impermissible, right? Yeah. So both of those reasons are going to cut against and show that skeptical theism is false. And then the third one, which is that there's an unknown reason for God permitting the evil, um, that will count against the perceived weight of God's reasons resembling the actual weight, right? But... Given this equiprobability principle, if we have no um, reason to favor that, uh, to think that there's an unknown reason for God permitting the evil over the view that there's an unknown reason against God permitting the evil, then those two will be equiprobable, right? So if those two are equiprobable, let's say we assign them each a probability of 0.5. Well, that takes up all our probability space, right? That's a problem, though, because there's a non-zero probability that there's no unknown reasons at all for God to uh, allow some instance of evil. But if that's the case, then we need to reduce each of the equiprobability or each each of the other hypotheses to below 0.5. Okay, so now you've seen that the only way for an evil to be rendered permissible is if there's an unknown reason that justifies God in allowing evil or, or an unknown justifying reason for God to allow it. Okay, but then we've already said that we have that the probability of that is less than 0.5, in which case the probability that some evil uh, that its perceived weight is impermissible is actually impermissible will be greater than one half. In yeah, which so, case, so the skeptical theism is false. So that's yeah, one the way probability to... the probability that the perceived weight of reasons really does resemble God's actual weight of reasons is going to be greater than one half. Then, okay, so that's the objection. And uh, moving on to another objection. No, I'm kidding. Uh, how do you respond to it? The issue here is that reality is biased towards permissibility. There are um, I go over four reasons to think this, but I'm just going to go over two of the sort of simplest ones. Uh, one reason to think that reality is uh, biased in favor of permissibility is um, because the default status of an action is just permissible. Actions are permissible unless there is a requiring reason against it. Um, but if that's the case, um, all actions in some sense uh, start out as permissible. And um, that's one reason that, like, it doesn't say that it's wildly biased towards permissibility, but it is one reason in favor of reality being biased towards permissibility. The second reason that I'm going to go over is, uh, and I'm going to be brief here and very rough, but the second reason is that there aren't moral dilemmas. There can't be moral dilemmas, and specifically prohibition dilemmas, where all the actions available to me are impermissible, right? So think about, like, Sophie's choice, where, um, suppose, uh, in Sophie's choice, uh, there's a book about it, but I'm uncultured swine, so I've never read it. But, you know, there's movies, which I've also never seen. But I got the gist of the movie, um, which is <laughs> that, um, you know, this lady uh, ends up at a um, she uh, ends up at a camp and the guards are asking her to choose one of her two children to send to the gas chambers. Right. So she has to choose which one to kill now. Um, and, you know, the thought is that, well, what she did there, uh, choosing to send one was not impermissible, right? She had to make a choice. And um, either uh, maybe you think that one of them would be permissible and the other wouldn't, but at the very least, one of them was permissible. But normally, suppose Sophie didn't have two children. She just had one. And the choice was send the child to the gas chambers or go to the camp with the child. You know, you might think they'd be impermissible for, to send her to the gas chambers. But those reasons will hold even when Sophie has two, right? Two children. In fact, she'll have the same reasons for each child not to send them to the gas chamber. In which case, it's going to be impermissible, given our first order reasons, to send either child to the gas chamber. But then our second order reasons kick in, and we see that, okay, well, Sophie has to make a choice. There's no way out of this, right? In which case, one of those actions is going to be permissible for her to do, um, to send one of the children, right? 
And um, I guess what I'm doing here is illustrating that like, you know, it's uh, there's a like in these cases where it looks like there's a moral dilemma, there really isn't one. And uh, at least one of the actions will be permissible. Um, and if there can't be moral dilemmas, that suggests a, a bias in reality towards moral, uh, a, a bias in morality towards or reality towards permissibility, right? And this is kind of the standard view in ethics is that there aren't moral pro, uh, moral dilemmas. This isn't like some out uh, some fringe view. This is uh, for whatever popularity means, which again probably isn't much in terms of philosophy. But Earl Coney has some really good stuff on this. So those are two reasons to think that reality is biased towards permissibility. But if we accept that. And again, this isn't saying reality is wildly biased towards permissibility. It's just to say that there's even it's just even a sliver will do to show that this equiprobability principle doesn't apply. Because even a sliver will give you one reason to favor the hypothesis that there's an unknown reason for God permitting the evil over there being an unknown reason against God permitting evil, the uh the evil. In which case the equiprobability principle goes out the window and this objection dissolves. Yeah, I mean, if if it's only ever so slightly more probable uh that um the unknown reasons kind of justify god than it is that the that there are unknown reasons that you know don't justify god or that that render it unjustified for god to permit it then provided that we have that other option you know it may still be the case that like if one of them is 48 percent probable and the other one's 47 percent um you could still have the five percent remaining coming oh, over sure. and that that's something I want to uh that is uh that's not what I'm conceding though, right? I'm not conceding that there's um so the thought is that given our public antecedent reasons, it's gonna be inscrutable whether there's this unknown reason in favor of God permitting evil, it's also gonna be inscrutable, um, whether there's an unknown reason against it. Um, and then there's you know the probability that there's none, right? So my only contention here is not that it's just slightly more probable, like uh, that I'm itching it from a sliver under 0.5 to closer to 0.5 or even above it. The contention is that we can't use that principle at all to say that the probabilities of um, there being an unknown reason in favor of the action and there being an unknown reason against it are equiprobable. We can't say that. And if we can't do that, this objection cannot get off the ground. It it uh, it just won't be applicable. Interesting. Right. So. So yeah, I mean, let, let's go back to the point where <clears throat> the kind of bias toward permissibility. So I mean, I think that actions in general, among the space of possible actions, it seems as though, yeah, there's like a bias in that space toward permiss toward permissibility. Um, but like, if we change the reference class, maybe the bias changes. I don't know. So like, suppose the reference class is not just all actions simpliciter, but it's like actions which involve allowing very, very bad things to occur. Uh, maybe in that sort of reference class, there actually isn't a bias toward um, permissibility. Actually, like most of the actions within that reference class are impermissible. And, and the, the, the case at hand is God allowing, you know, a very terrible thing to occur. And so then even though actions in general, there's a bias toward permissibility with respect to them, maybe in this reference class, there's actually like a preponderance of... Um, uh, impermissible actions? I don't know. So the unknown reason wouldn't have to itself justify, because again, the whether a, an action is permissible depends on the uh, is a function of the weight of reasons for and against, right? And so it might not, if we have these horrendous actions, it's not like you're searching for this one that would do the trick, although that could be the case. It's just like, you know, there could be uh, all the, uh, it, it's just, uh, it, it depends on the weight, right? So <clears throat> It's not, I, I don't see how changing the reference class would affect this, I guess. So the question here is we have these two hypotheses. One is that there's an unknown reason and that counts in, counts in favor of God permitting an action. The other is that there's an un, unknown reason that counts against. And as long as we have this um, uh, reality being biased, right, it's going to show us that uh, reality being biased towards permissibility in general. Like, because to say there's an unknown reason doesn't mean that that reason automatically justifies it. Because again, it depends on the weight of the other reasons in play. So I don't think it, I don't, I guess I don't see how that would, I don't think that would affect it. Okay. Interesting. So I'm, I'm just going to have to reflect on that further. That's just the thing that immediately came to my mind when I heard you speaking. So just wanted to throw it out there. Okay. So just a, a couple more objections and then we'll close it out. Um, one of them is with respect to, um, well, the thought is that skeptical theism kind of just 
trashes theism's predictive power. So uh, the thought is that skeptical theism, theism is very damaging to natural theology. Very often in natural theology, like fine tuning arguments, we're saying like, hey, wouldn't it be a good thing if there's life or something like that? Or wouldn't it be a good thing if there are these embodied conscious moral agents or something like that? We're then going to have to make a judgment about God's reasons for actual life. Like on the basis of it being good, God has all things considered reason to actualize uh, a world containing life. And so it's not super duper improbable that he'd fine tune a universe. But like once we go along with your deontological skeptical theism, you know, um, the perceived weight of God's reasons, we, we don't have any good public antecedent reason to think that the perceived weight of God's reasons for actualizing a, a life permitting universe really resemble God's actual weight of reasons for actualizing the life permitting universe. And so we actually, that judgment, just as in the case of the, the problem of evil, that judgment is undermined. That judgment that God, all things considered, has um, good reason to actualize uh, a life permitting universe or something like that. And this is going to apply across the board. So the thought goes to theistic arguments which involve predicting what God would do, like what God would have reason to do. So it seems as though the skeptical theism here is going to be incredibly damaging to natural theology, and people are going to have to give up a lot of their favorite arguments. Yeah, so one, uh, two brief comments here. One is that, so I this uh, seems in a qualified sense, yes, that's correct. Um, uh, but no, uh, um, yeah, right. This this is this isn't going to matter for like this isn't going to touch anything like modal cosmological arguments, um, moral arguments. Well, the onto ones that aren't epistemic moral arguments. Um, so the ones that are arguments. terrible. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not kidding. So, no, um, I, I'm not. No, I'm really not kidding. But OK, go on. Right, right. So my again, I am not uh, or the Kalam cosmological argument, which I know you love. Um, but right. So there are all these sorts of arguments. They aren't even candidates for being undermined by skeptical theism. I'm not endorsing them. I'm just saying they're not candidates for being undermined. So don't don't uh, have a stroke uh, by, by mentioning <laughs> right. all those arguments there. It won't apply to some, at least a, a number of natural theological arguments. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, but it's true that the, it's definitely true that the traditional way that lots of people motivate arguments like uh, uh, fine tuning arguments, the psychophysical harmony argument, um, uh, arguments from consciousness, arguments from moral, moral knowledge. It's definitely true that the typical way those are motivated are going to be undermined by skeptical theism and also deontological skeptical theism. Definitely true. Um, but I also, uh, man, I feel like I'm a, doing a sales pitch for an outrageously expensive book that no one's going to buy. Um, but I do have it. In, like I said, I do develop a model of predicting God's actions, and I do it in. Tan I do it for several theodicies, and then also the psychophysical harmony argument and the argument from conscious agents. Um, so I do think that there is a way to predict, uh, to um, see that those are evidence for, uh, I think there's a way for skeptical theists to claim that psychophysical harmony and the argument from consciousness, also probably moral knowledge and stuff like that, is evidence for theism. I also, and uh, just for you, I develop an arg uh, uh in this model, I also show how you can develop an argument for atheism uh, that is immune to skeptical theism. Uh, you can think it's my present to you. Um, but so so I guess this is just me punting saying it's true that these arguments are going to be undermined by skeptical theism, at least the way they're traditionally motivated. But you don't have to motivate it in that way. I have another model where you can do it in a much better way. Um, that is yeah. It, is, is there like a 90 second pitch for how to do that? There is not. Um, <laughs> oh, man, there is this a is book the... chapter that I'll take you 90 <laughs> minutes to read and it'll. <laughs> for you <laughs> i should have i should have given you that task as homework make a 90 second pitch for that because yeah anyway um so people will check out the book for perry's halfway conciliatory but halfway also non-conciliatory response but like yeah the traditional ways of motivating these sorts of arguments are actually gonna have to go out the window but um but perry argues that you can still develop these sorts of arguments, at least in different ways. Two more objections that I, I we because these are just so popular on on the internet sphere. Um, first one is kind of moral aporia or moral paralysis. So like, hey, uh, if we are unaware, or like we have no good antecedent reason, public reason to think that uh, God's the perceived weight of God's reasons, like the the reasons of God's reasons of which we are aware, if we have no good reason to think that those are that those resemble the actual weight of God's reasons, then. Man, like th this objection seems a lot better under the axiological uh, version. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, and, and I mean, it's in terms of God's reasons. So, well, maybe the thought is, hey, God is a moral exemplar. And so if we have no clue 
whether or not God's reasons, the act like our, the perceived weight of God's reasons for allowing this person to drown right in front of me is, you know, resembles his actual weight of reasons. Um, well, then maybe that should like lead us to infer something about our reasons. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure how to put this objection in a way that it applies to deontological skeptical theism. I guess I thought it, what I'm thinking is like God is a moral exemplar. And so like, if God's not doing something, um, or like we don't know whether or not God has reason to do something, why would it follow that we wouldn't we wouldn't know whether or not we have reason to do something? Anyway, I'll turn it over to you. Um, this objection seems to me to go a lot better for axiological skeptical theism, but I'll just turn it over to you. For the audience, I don't endorse this objection, okay? Um, but it's a popular one. Have people run this against deontological skeptical theism? Secondly, even if they haven't, could they? Like, and how could it be done? And thirdly, even if they could, does it succeed? That's what, I, that's what I'm going to ask you. I should have done that first, at the beginning. No to the first one, because one, I just uh, published it not too long ago, a paper on it, and then uh, deontological skeptical theism, so no one's run. I mean, in person, someone might have mentioned it, but yeah, I'm kind of, it's a major bummer that you knew exactly what I was going to say, which is that, of course, this doesn't apply. This uh, this just isn't going to work, because deontological skeptical theism is about God's reasons, not our reasons. So <laughs> yeah. it's just obvious that it's not going to have any effect there. Um, and for that reason, I don't, I, I don't see how the moral exemplar thing is going to work because again, like we, like, um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't see how that could get off the ground. I don't think this is going to be successful just because of that. And even if it is, it's going to be like, it'd be really tough to tease out. No, like, cause you'd have to basically, I think maybe reject a distinction between God's reasons and human reasons, but that's obviously false. Yeah, or somehow God's reasons are like a guide. Maybe that's the idea. Like God's reasons are a guide to human reasons such that like if we find out, or, like if we were to find out that we're in the dark about God's reasons about something, um, then that kind of infects our reasons uh, or that that infects what we should think about our own reasons. Um, no, because he occupies a different relation. So it shouldn't. That, I know. That... <laughs> and let me also flag that I dislike this in the dark language. I think it's inaccurate. I don't think skeptical theists or their critics should be using that in the dark or for all we know language. <laughs> uh that was uh uh yeah i can't stand that i have a paper addressing that uh it, it leads to so many bad objections to skeptical theism um that could just be avoided if we use different language interesting um, okay so maybe th so the moral aporia I, I i i agree with you that that's not I, I don't think that challenges deontological skeptical theism so the next one which is kind of popular on the internet sphere is um the objection from divine deception so um the thought is like well hey um if we have no good antecedent public reason to think that uh, the perceived weight of God's reasons resembles the actual weight of God's reasons, well, then, even if the perceived weight of God's reasons, you know, the reasons of which we're aware doesn't tell in favor of God uh, lying to us through certain religious uh, scriptures or what have you, that doesn't give us any reason to think that um, God's actual weight of reasons don't tell in favor of doing that. So, so for all we know, <laughs> I know you don't like that, but like, listen, um, it seems as though... Like, w would you, would it make the probability that God's lying in the Bible, like, inscrutable? Because, um, you know, like, that would seem to require us having a good grip on God's actual weight, like, the actual weight of God's reasons bearing on whether or not he's going to lie to us in the biblical texts. So I'm wondering what you think about that. So I think that Hud Hudson's version of this is very good. Um, he has a little novel called The Grotesque in the Garden. And then he also has a paper called The Father of Lies, which is the paper that got me into skeptical theism. And he develops this objection very well and very powerfully. I think that his is the version to go with um, if you're thinking in terms of excessive skepticism. So I'm going to address his version, which is uh, if, uh, to give me a more specific target because that's the one I've thought about a lot. But like the thought behind his version is something like, well, like let's say that we have this divine, uh, this instance of divine revelation or purported divine revelation. And it says like, um, I don't know what constant to give me. Let's just say God says X. Um, and the question is, you know, like, well, do, can we justifiably believe X? Uh, can we know X and pick your favorite epistemic property? Um, you know, justification or knowledge. We'll, we'll go with justification. And so the question is, can we justifiably believe that? And, um, uh, Hudson wants to say, you know, well, look, like, we are wildly different than God. If the if he has a, um, we aren't able to, and he is a skeptical theist. So he wants to say like the fact that we don't know of a reason for why God would deceive us about X or lie to us even 
isn't a good reason. It doesn't make it likely that he's not going to deceive us or lie to us about X, right? And, but if that's the case, then we can't sort of, we can't generate a positive reason to trust God with respect to this instance of testimony. Okay, so that's the layout. Um, so he says, but we can't, if we can't um, have this positive reason to trust God with respect to this instance of testimony, then we can't justifiably believe it um, and we lose any justification for thinking it, right? But then if that's the case, then all divine revelation, uh, any beliefs predicated on that, on divine testimony alone, those are going to be unjustified. That's the problem. Now, for this, we need to get a little bit into some uh, muddy epistemology, uh, the muddy waters of epistemology of testimony, right? Um, and so very briefly and roughly and mostly accurately, but I'm going to skip over some qualifications. Um, there are the two main views are reductionism and non-reductionism. Reductionists about testimo testimonial knowledge uh, think that in order to justifiably believe what somebody says, you need good quality testimony from them. And then you also need to have a positive reason to trust their testimony with respect to that uh, instance, with respect to what they're testifying about. That's the reductionist view. So in it, you, you don't really get testimonial justification for free. You got to do some work. You know, those lazy non-reductionists, though, they say, look, all you need is good quality testimony and no defeaters. You don't really uh, you don't have to do any work. Testimony comes for free. We get justification. Uh, uh, it's, it's its own source of justification. And, okay, so those are the two main views. Again, for whatever it's worth, and again, probably not much. The majority view seems to me to be the non-reductionist view. But there's also this added uh, bonus to the non-reductionist view, which is that it's true, which is always a bonus for a philosophical view. So, he, and by now, you should see what's what I'm going to say in response to Hudson's argument, which is, uh, that he is, and explicitly so, assuming a reductionist view of testimonial justification. He thinks you have to have this positive reason in order for your beliefs to be justified. But, you know, non-reductionism is true, so you actually don't have to uh, have these positive reasons. And so in order for your be beliefs based on divine revelation to be justified, all you need is the good quality testimony. All it has to be is good quality, and then you'll have justification. Just like all I need when you tell me that, uh, you know, you just had a goatee, all I need is your good quality testimony that you in fact had one. Um, I don't need to like think of whether you're, uh, I don't need to generate this positive reason to trust you with respect to that testimony. Or just like when I tell my daughters that, you know, this is your grandma, you know, they don't need to generate this positive reason for trusting me with respect to grandma testimony. They just have the justified beliefs. And all of this is to say, though, so bringing it back, is that uh, this kind of objection to um, this kind of divine deception objection is only going to cut ice with reductionists about um, testimonial knowledge or testimonial justification. But reductionism is false. So that's where the objection goes astray. But I think that Hudson just um, does a really fantastic job of illustrating the worry, and his is a very powerful statement of it. Interesting. Okay. Um, just... Two more objections, then we're going to have to end because it's like midnight for me and I'm so tired. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. One is like the radical skepticism objection. So I guess it's like a very similar idea. How do we know that God isn't just deceiving us? Or maybe God has really good reason of which we are unaware for allowing us to be just totally deceived. Um, it seems like a skeptical theism would lead us into kind of radical skepticism or a skepticism about the external world. So what do you make of that objection? I know it's very informally articulated as I just put it, but. This is the most bothersome one in the sense that it seems to me that oftentimes when this objection is given, um, people just make up their epistemology as they goes, as they go, right? So they give these examples and they like, you know, can't you can't rule out that uh, you can't give this reason for thinking that world isn't like older than 5,000 years, therefore skepticism or something like that. Way too quick. We need to do the epistemology first and then uh, see what falls out from that. And when you do it, like, I mean, you can see just in general on any theory of knowledge is any theory of knowledge is compatible or any mainstream theory of knowledge is going to be compatible with skeptical theists, knowing that there's an external world, right? Um, just like think of the reliableist way, as long as the, at, at least, I guess, let me qualify that. Like, I think this is going to hold for internalist views as well, but at the very least, externalist views of knowledge, you're going to be able to pretty easily know that there's a world and that it's older than, 
you know, uh, 5,000 years or whatever. And that, uh, and you can know moral facts in the same way. Um, just, yeah. So I guess in general, like when we look at epistemological theories, we can see that they are compatible with skeptical theism, in which case skeptical theism isn't really doing this work here. Now you might say, well, look, Perry, they're not just saying that it's incompatible with these theories, which they don't mention at all. They're just trying to say that you have this defeater, uh, for this, for this view, uh, for, for like thinking that the earth is older than 5,000 years. Right. But, you know, that's not clear either. When we look at the literature on defeaters, and again, I talk about this more extensively elsewhere, it's just not, it just doesn't seem clear at all that skeptical theists have any kind of defeater, uh, any kind of the mainstream views, uh, any, that any kind of the mainstream defeaters apply to skeptical theists' common sense beliefs. It's just not clear at all that it uh, is the case. I mean, do you think it's not an undercutting defeater? Is it inscrutable? Like the probability under um, deontological skeptical theism that you know, God has really good reason to allow me to be like radically deceived. Like, is the probability of that inscrutable under skeptical theism or? Um, I think it's going to have to be given your public antecedent reasons. Uh, but as I said, um, there is a method for predicting God's actions that I have that is compatible with skeptical theism. Interesting. Um, so yeah, I, and also I wanted to mention this, which will be relevant here, but also to divine deception. Some people think that God just can't lie or deceive. And if that's the case, you're going to have a pretty easy response to this. But um, I don't know how plausible it is. Mark Murphy commits me for a few minutes in uh, one of his books, but I'm not a, I'm not sure I'm still convinced, um, at least with respect <laughs> to lying, not deception, because I think even you can run the worry with deception. You don't need lies. Yeah, I don't think you... It. Yeah, but and yeah. I mean, so that is, that God. it's worth flagging that that's an that that's one view you might hold, um, but I'm not sure it's. I'm a little. I'm I'm skeptical. It's correct. Yeah, I'm I'm very skeptical of that. I mean, I think like one of the main motivations for that view that I've seen, and again, this is not like the only motivation, but it's like oh, lying is like intrinsically impermissible and that sort of thing. But like now you're getting into like Kant's ludicrous views, and like you can't lie to the Gestapo who are asking whether or not you're hiding Jews in your basement. I'm like, if your moral theory entails that you can't do that, I'm sorry, your moral theory is false. But you've gotten me Midnight Joe, where I'm just very blunt. Um, let's see. Uh, the Midnight Joe, are we talking like coffee at midnight? Is that what that? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. OK, so we've gone to the radical skepticism objection. Um, the final objection that we're going to be considering is. Oh uh, it's just the thought that, like, couldn't your deontological skeptical theism be used with, like, literally any amount of evil? Like, suppose, suppo OK, this is not actually the case, but like, suppose that the space time manifold is like just populated by like just conscious creatures that are just unending agony they're just like wired up to these machines for all eternity past and future for their entire lives all they have is just like stimulating their pain centers so they're just in, emo they're in agony and you know an observer comes along and they're like oh gosh like surely this makes surely this means god does not exist or is at least very improbable like surely that's very powerful evidence against god's existence but here along comes the deontological skeptical theist perry hendrix oh hold on a second there are no good public antecedent reasons for thinking that um the perceived weight of god's reasons resembles the actual weight of god's reasons so um you know you're sort of relying on claims about the actual weight of God's reasons for whether or not, you know, God would allow this sort of thing, whether or not God has a justifying reason to permit this sort of thing. But, you know, you're not, you're not allowed to do that. So, uh, so the thought is if your deontological skeptical theism were true, then we would not have a very good argument for atheism in this sort of scenario, but we do have a very good athe argument for atheism in this sort of scenario. So deontological skeptical theism is false. What do you make of that? Not a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've really like I don't understand this has been popping up a little more it's really puzzling to me why people think this is some I shouldn't slander this so let me just say I'm surprised by it so um yeah I, I don't like the like you could that doesn't just because in that world are uh the perceived weight of God's reasons doesn't we have no good reason to think the perceived weight resembles the actual weight of his reasons doesn't mean we can't like justify atheism in some other way like why would it be why would we choose this horrible method of we don't see any reason so therefore there why would we do that um or like like there's other ways to try to motivate atheism well i'd have to think about it more but there's at least none that are ruled like it's like there's no reason to think that that's the way to go why would that be the way to go um uh why would that be the way to go in that kind of world like 
I, I don't think it's a bold to bite to say, no, of course, that wouldn't be a good reason that like, so you see all these instances of uh, people suffering horrendously, um, you know, and yeah, I don't think that would be like, I mean, think about like any child, like, this is interesting, actually, this, this might be kind of interesting, like, any child who is a part of the, uh, like, Holocaust or something, they would be in that situation that you're talking about, like, if they're young enough, that would be their whole world that they knew about, right? So it's kind of what you're talking about. Um, so there are real life cases of that. And yeah, I don't, that just wouldn't be, there, there might be other reasons to think that that supports atheism, but not, uh, I mean, certainly not a no, it's certainly not, the, the way that people run this too is this no seem argument usually. And like, I, I don't understand why anyone, like, why would that be your go-to argument for atheism? You have all the suffering and, and so on there. And your go-to argument is a no seem inference. Like, come on, you can think of something better than that. Um, yeah, so I guess, I guess I'm saying I don't think it's a bolt to bite, and I don't think anyone has really given a good statement, uh, a good motivation to think it is an actual bolt to bite, because uh, I do, I don't like biting bolts, it's bad for your teeth, and not a good practice to do. Um, so I don't want to bite a bullet, I just don't think it's a bullet. So, I mean, I guess they could run the argument using the methodology you develop in your, in your book, maybe, is that what you'd suggest? Yeah, I, mean, could, like... I don't think it would be successful, but that'd be the way to do it. That'd be one way to do it for sure. Um, I mean, could, in a much better way. So they wouldn't be able to reason, in your view, on on the weight of God's reasons um, for actualizing such a world. Um, yeah, the perceived weight, I don't think, would be a good uh, way to it. Especially, I mean, so think of these, like, um, if you had the, uh, uh, if you ran it in the no CM way, I don't think it'd be successful. I don't think it would, I think, I'm not even sure it would be successful. It definitely, it wouldn't be, it, it, non-controversially, I don't think it would be successful in the human one. Maybe you're too uh, tired to agree with this, but I think that even you would agree that a human argument from this kind of evil wouldn't work, uh, at least as traditionally run with the hypothesis of indifference. So let me qualify it that way. I think that that might not work given the hypothesis of indifference. Okay, well, um, I mean, I, it's, I'm it's, sort of like, I'm sort of not in it right now. I mean, I'm very, very tired. And also, I, I think tell I you hit a wall about five minutes ago. And uh, yeah. And uh, I also, I think I was bit by a spider. So like my, I've got this bump on my knee or my leg now. So <laughs> uh, there you tried shooting webs. Um, oh, well, uh, I, I'm so tired. Uh, thank you, Perry, for coming on. Do you have any last words? Last words are, I think I actually just misspoke about the hypothesis of indifference. And I'm not sure it actually, I'm not sure it's true that uh, what I was saying is right on that last point. That's all I got. Uh, well, <laughs> Yeah, I don't think oh I don't think I have goodness. any other interesting uh interesting points. Yeah, that was a fantastically informative discussion and I hope the audience got a lot out of it. I hope they learned a lot about skeptical theism, what it is, how it interacts with problems of evil, what are some various objections to it and how would an actual live skeptical theist respond to them. So I hope it was very informative to you guys. If you see value in the work that I do, if you see value in the sorts of discussions that I have and uh, the way that they're done in a kind of um, truth-oriented, love-oriented kind of way and not trying to beat people down and beat people over the head, but really trying to get to the truth of the matter and trying to discover things and trying to get a greater understanding of the issues. If you see value in all that sort of stuff, please consider supporting me on Patreon or making a one-time donation via PayPal. Links to those are in the description. Check out the Madison of Reason Discord server. Link to that is also in the description. As well, also in the description, you can find a link to podcast versions of my Madison Reason episodes. So that's <clears throat> pretty cool. What better way to end is there than I'm Joe Schmidt. This is the Madison of Reason and peace out. <laughs>